85% of artists in major American art museum collections are white, and then 1.2% are black. The general public is not aware of the contributions African American artists had made to American culture in general. David Driscoll, a professor of art at the University of Maryland, has organized this show called Two Centuries of Black American Art. Had this black art exhibition not been organized, many of the artists who are shown here never would have been seen. Two Centuries of Black Art was the first major modern exhibition which brought the black subject to the attention of the American public. It wasn't an exhibition that was supposed to do everything for everybody. David Driscoll helped move us forward during a time where we were still fighting for space in museums. It's not always about being appreciated. Sometimes it's about being reviled. I did what I wanted to do and paid the price. I just stay out till I get in. Whenever you made work, it ought to be about something. And it ought to be about something that mattered. You'd be the first African-American painter to paint the first African-American president is absolutely overwhelming. We're part of a continued renaissance. It's been happening. There have always been black curators. There have always been black artists. They just perhaps have not been part of the mainstream. You start to understand the enormous struggle that this country has been on to feature and to display and to honor the work of black artists. This is something that had to be done because the American canon is not complete without it. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we're excited to be talking to uh, the people who are part of a wonderful new HBO uh, project called Black Art, uh, Thelma Golden and Jordan Castile. We're gonna get right into this uh, by me introducing you to which AFCA members are taking part in this call today, starting with Reginald Pounder in Chicago, KB in Houston, Kim Singleton, New York City, Al McGee in South Florida, and Carolyn in Toronto, and of course, Rhonda Rasha Penrise in Atlanta. I'm gonna let you guys do what you do so well, and I'll see you on the other side. Hi guys, this, this is uh, Reggie Ponder, the real critic from Chicago. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. There's, there's a question that I have about, do you guys struggle with this issue? And if they talk about a little bit in the, in the film, do you guys struggle a little bit with being a black artist, but seeking to be recognized globally or internationally as, as just an artist? Is there a struggle there? Yeah, I mean, I can speak on behalf of artists explicitly, and then Thelma, maybe you can offer some insight from your perspective and, and you really bearing witness to the um, evolution of our own kind of self-identifying. And I think the self-identifying part of it is uh, key here and in the way that artists um, as human beings can choose how they want to move through the art world is up to them first and foremost. But there are obviously ways in which the art world imposes certain um, labelings or categorization that helps create a fluid accessibility point for their sense of knowing or understanding the artist's experience. And I think there's that which is explicitly true, which is that we identify as Black, most of us, or maybe have a family member or whatever it is that those who identify as Black, my Blackness is always going to be inherent to my artistry um, because it's a part of my experience as being a woman is, that I'm also a woman artist, that I am a young artist, that I am an emerging artist. All those things are titles that I hold with a, a certain amount of resonance and truth and in no way shy away from. I think the challenging point or the important point of this moment is turning that back around and asking um, to be really included in the, in the general category of artists first, that we are makers who have been a part of the canon for a very long time. And this documentary really highlights that, that the work of those before us as one of the youngest represented in the film um, is profoundly important, that we have to acknowledge those truths and their experiences that um, are still going to be some level present today. But uh, I just love and revel in the moment that I get to remind people that, um, I'm a human being <laughs> and that the work has my lens present within it, but those boxes does no one favors in the long term of my historical contributions to the canon as a whole. 
I think Jordan has spoken to um, this very eloquently and I um, see and understand your question because in many ways, um, mainstream art history has presented this as a struggle, but I think what you see and what we see in the legacy of David Driscoll is really this is a celebration of what it means, the breadth and the depth of the work that Black artists make, that it is inherently American, that it speaks to a global sensibility, that it connects itself to you know, the entire history of Black people in a global Black presence, and that has been present in the work of Black artists for centuries. Thank you so much. KB here with the Color Grade Podcast, a beautiful documentary. Uh, I have a question just about what current up and coming Black artists do you guys have your eye on right now and that you guys are currently supporting and just want to share with the world? And I can start with you, Jordan. Yeah, I was going to throw it at Thelma first because I was curious as well. I mean, it's there are so many that are constantly on the table of curiosity for me. I'm loving the sense of freedom that I'm feeling across the board amongst artists, that people are being unapologetic in their um, display of, of artistry, whatever that might be, whether it's painting or it's film, there's so much creative energy that I feel really in the thick of it right now that I'm just like, all I have to do is reach an arm out and I'm touching someone else that's inspiring me in one way or another. Um, so it's hard for me to give like a very specific name Maybe you can tell, I don't know. I get hesitant because there's so many, I know I'm not gonna name, like I would name two and then I'd be mad because I'd leave here and be like, oh, like there's like five okay. more. Yeah, that's, that's it. This is an incredible moment. This is a moment mm -hmm. with an incredible amount of creativity among black artists. It is an incredible moment for emerging artists. You know, the ground that has been laid by the generation before makes that possible. But I will with my, um, in my role as director of the Studio Museum, we'll speak about three artists whose work is on view in New York right now, our current artists in residence, E. Jane, Nadeline Pierre, and Elliot Reed, who are in an exhibition, exhibition called The Longing Vessel and that was curated by um, our Studio Museum curator, Legacy Russell. Jordan was in our residency program a few years ago, and it is a place where at, throughout the museum's history, we have created an opportunity for emerging artists. So I would say right now, I'm excited about this year's artists in residence as their work is now out in the world. That's perfect. Well, thank I love, you. I love that. Thank you yeah. so much. Hi there. Um, this is Carolyn from Toronto. Uh, my website is called View from the Dark. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the documentary. Um, for me, it was really personal because my father was an artist. So to me, um, it, it's like he was kind of, and it's weird because he was a Black Caribbean artist, but he was all I knew. So even though he was an artist, like he was um, influenced by the European masters. So my question for you is um, in terms of black curators and black critics, how do you think that that's coming up um, in terms of having like um, a black point of view um, critiquing black art? Um, mm -hmm. Is that, is there a way to nurture that I guess in schools or in, um, you know, I guess society at large? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, of course. And I think, you know, again, the center of this film is celebrating David Driscoll's legacy. And the reason uh, Mr. Driscoll was so incomparable is that he was an artist. He was an art historian. He was a curator. He was a critic. He stood for um, a very profound sense of rigor in all of those modes and fields. And I think this encouragement of the training and the nurturing right, of, of, of people to do all of that work, right? So that we'd have curators and critics. Now, again, just as it exists for artists, I think we are living in a moment with um, curators in institutions all over this country and in yours, you know, one of the wonderful communities that I've gotten to spend time in is in the Black Art community in Toronto, um, which, you know, some of my favorite curators as well as uh, artists are there. But, you know, this is what has created um, again, this moment that we're seeing where there is so much thinking and presenting of work by Black artists that is coming from the wide and rich field of curators and critics. And 
the encouragement that we continue to create space for all of those voices. I just have to add in there, like the power of the studio museum. I can't help but think of what you're describing, Thelma, and associate almost all the Black curators or critics that I'm aware of, all have some arm that has touched the studio museum, similar to David Driscoll touching everyone else and the power that he offered is the same kind of institutional power that I think the museum wields um, as an incubus for many artists mm -hmm. to find themselves and sprout from mm -hmm. artists, curators, everybody kind of having a home there mm -hmm. and seeing that as the beginning for learning and seeing their own value to the greater world and rigor. The rigor is there and demanding. Good afternoon, Thelma <laughs> and Jordan. Uh, first of all, watching the documentary was very, very great to watch. And uh, as a former educator myself, I really learned much more about the art world, especially African-Americans. Now, uh, first question to you, Thelma, was it really hard to uh, get the David and Charles White and Faith Regal and, and Richard Mayhew and Swiss Beatham to participate in this? And Jordan, though, how do people get to know your artwork besides going to the studio museum? In other ways, how do we get to know your art? Uh, first, uh, Thelma, go ahead. Yes, well, I have to give a lot of credit to the director um, of the film, Sam Pollard. And I think that your question is one um, that should be put to Sam, but what I'll answer is, is I think because of his long history and legacy of being an important narrative storyteller, that the artists that he asked to participate, I think were eager to be part of the sort of larger narrative that he was creating. Of course, it's centered on David Driscoll, who we sadly lost um, earlier uh, at the, um, in last spring, but as Sam Pollard and his team were able to spend, have spent time with him, filmed him, spent time in his home, in his studio. And then also they did the same with the other artists. So I think that the ease had to do with the kind of shared commitment to tell this story. I, I think everyone involved wanted this story to be told. And I think Jordan, where you could see her work, well, she, she won't toot her own horn, but I'll say, you know, Jordan, just a, a major exhibition of her work just closed here in New York at the New Museum, which achieved critical acclaim. It was an absolutely stunning exhibition, but her work is in museums all around this country. But Jordan, you can answer. Just want to make sure that was well, you, know, because you probably know. I didn't know that she had a great exhibition there. And there's a beautiful publication. Yeah. as well. Yeah, great. I mean, this is for me even hearing, thank you, Thelma, because it, it was easy. I think most of the artists who participated in the film would say that it was an easy yes. I think all of us recognize the power of our collectivity and the power of our those who've come before us and honoring that, um, that when the email came in from Sam Pollard, it was like an automatic, yeah, let's make it happen. There's a certain sense of respect to the work that he's been doing for a very long time that we all are aware of. Um, and knew that we would be safely taken care of within the context that had been pre presented to us. So, um, and I felt that from the beginning of the process through to the end, um, watching the film, you feel that, you feel the sense that there's a great amount of respect and care amongst the artists, even in our differences um, and the differences of our practices. But in my personal practice, if I think about how people can get to know me or the work of artists today outside of this film or outside of visiting a museum is part of the thing that I know that I'm thinking about specifically a lot is accessibility, that how Instagram, social media, there's so many modes in which we can tell our stories and share our practices that are literally in the hands of the masses that I think many of us are trying to tap into, whether it is, um, for example, I, I painted the cover of Vogue, the September issue this past uh, September. And that was something that I wasn't entirely sure of as a platform that I saw for myself. But at the same time, it was an easy yes, because it right. would be an opportunity to create um, a mass consumption of the work itself and the intent of the work as a whole. So people could have the painting cover and feel like full on participants in my practice. So there are many modes I think of connecting now. Oh, which is a gift. Well, thank you very much. And I just like to make this comment. One of my good friends back in the day was Walter Sanford. Sanford, he was a pencil artist. Mm. Uh, and I knew him very well before he died in 1987. I love that. 
And I love that. Great. I didn't realize who he really was, even though he told me, but until after his death. Mm. I really missed mm. the guy. Yeah. And his voice is one of many in this. You know oh, what I mean? Like it's oh, people yeah. like him that will be reminded through this documentary mm -hmm. or remembered, really. Yeah. Hello everyone, um, Kim Singleton out of New York City, considered a Black Lit television show, and I absolutely love the film. I have been a fan of the Studio Museum forever, Thelma. I've been to many events there, Thank and you. you're just doing an amazing job in Harlem. Um, my you. question had to do with um, Faith Ringel in the story. Um, mm -hmm. She had mentioned how, it seemed like she wasn't, in, she didn't get a seat at the table. She wasn't um, included into the spiral group you know, even though there was, it was mostly men and it was one woman. And when she had tried to do a exhibit at the studio museum, she was turned down. Now there was said mm -hmm. in the documentary that maybe her work wasn't up to par, but I felt like it was something a little deeper there. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you had any insights or what you thought about that whole, not including her in the circle at that time. What did you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, faith um, has been so important to uh, give us all what has been this important history of Black women and Black feminist art, right? And faith has spoken so much about the gender politics that existed in our art and culture world and the way in which those gender politics played out so that the history of Black art as it was written for a long time included really only the voices of men. You know, it's been the work of many of us who've come up in the art world as curators and art historians after that moment who've understood what it means to claim those voices of women artists and to reinsert them into the history. And so I think we are grateful to Faith and the work that she did creating many coalitions, protesting institutions, speaking out and creating space, not just for herself. I mean, because I don't think her aim was ever for just faith in her own work, but for women artists as a whole. Hi, it's Rhonda Roche Penrose. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, Thelma in particular, like we've seen a lot of um, documentaries about um, Black art, not enough. You've seen more than I have. And this strikes me as um, one of, I mean, it's one of the finest I have seen. So what do you hope this is able to do what other documentaries haven't? Well, I think, I hope this just adds to the dialogue. I mean, you're right. There have been some other documentaries, but not enough. You know, I still think that we, you know, another question referred to this, you know, my goal always is to have as many people as possible be able to know about the work of artists, not just those who have the opportunity to go to museums or to galleries, but to really be able to understand and know and see and be inspired by. Um, the work of Black artists. So my hope is this documentary opens the door to many more um, about individual artists, about their particular stories, about the ways in which they've created history for themselves and for others. And I think through the story told here of David Driscoll's Two Centuries, um, exhibition, as well as the stories of the artists who are part um, of this documentary, it gives us a place to consider the past, but also to imagine uh, more possibilities to explore in the future. Hi, this, this question is for, for Thelma. Thelma, um, my, my initial question when I asked you, as you guys are, as artists, you know, what do you think about, you know, are you Black first or not? And I asked that as a general question, understanding that you're a curator and Driscoll did all the things that you said that he did. He was a curator, he was a historian, he was an artist. I consider you curators artists that you guys have to paint a landscape. You have to tell a story. I wanna ask that the question to you, do you consider yourself an artist or do you feel like you're kind of outside, outside that circle? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I do not consider myself an artist um, because I think to be an artist means that you engage in the making of artwork. And I don't. I am a curator and my work is engaging with artists, uh, presenting their work. I see myself as an interlocutor between artists, the art object and audience. Um, I'm a curator who's always worked in museums. So my commitment is to the public display of work and the engagement with audiences in 
in public space. Um, I don't see myself as outside of what artists do, but I see my role differently. And my hope is, is in that role, I offer something in that exchange um, with the artists that I work with and have worked with over my 35 year career. I see Jordan, you're shaking your head. So you must have something to say to that. No, it's just, I love it. I mean, I, that was an interesting question that I hadn't actually considered as it relates specifically to curators and the work of someone such as Thelma, that all of us would say that her work is directly intertwined with ours, that um, in many ways we are because she is and because David Driscoll was, and you know, all of those things are just truths. Mm -hmm. And as she's describing the work that she's doing as an, I'm just not like, yeah, that's exactly what she does. She plays the connector to our practices, helps sometimes um, articulate in language between, she's like the mediator between all these different fields, whether it's the white, white wall that our work gets put on to help kind of transfer it from our studio spaces and from our heads into the world. Um, and, and we need curators. We need the work of Thelma, um, even as we work together. It's a partnership, no doubt. But um, yeah, we do do something very uniquely our own as well. well what well, she does, I couldn't do. So, <laughs> you know. well, 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 thank you, Thelma, for that answer. I, I just want to say is thank you for, if you're not an artist, for painting the landscape for me because the, some of the some of the things that you've done and that I've seen are just absolutely marvelous. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you. One of my uh, loves is Afrofuturism. And mm -hmm. I, I see artists generally as Afrofuturists because especially black artists, because you have to insert yourself into an environment that doesn't accept you or never really thought of black people in the first place. So Jordan, um, my question to you is how do you kind of uh, fit yourself into that realm of Afrofuturism or do you even think about it? I think about it a lot. I, okay. I think about it, um, I don't, it's, it's like you described, it is a, an awareness for me of the context of the work and the environment that I'm making it within and then the environments of the works themselves. The imaginative space that I create, my ability to stretch the means of what is real and provides an, an entry point for others into something that they might not have understood otherwise. That yeah, there is an app. I am absolutely dedicated towards building my own future. I'm absolutely dedicated to my own imagination. I know I need my imagination in a world that hasn't imagined for me um, or always considered me. So those things are inherently true. And so I think about it in those very technical terms. It's not that I would say that people describe my work as being directly aligned with Afrofuturism, but there are aspects of it as a literal kind of the future of an emerging artist. There are parts of that that are literally embodied to me in the work that I am acutely aware of um, and am not in any way afraid of. So I think there are aspects of that that are going to be true with regard and regardless. And sometimes if I want to do something crazy with a color, like why not, you know, like, because I can imagine my future. I want to belong there. I want to feel safe in those spaces. So I get to create them. That's part of what's being defined by that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, this is Al McGee again. Uh, first, Thelma, this is uh, to you. Yeah. Uh, in 1974, when David Driscoll, he uh, put up his exhibit, the people who had access to the media were very negative. Do you still see that today, the people who had access to the media are still negative against African-American works? And uh, to you, Jordan, what really inspired you or what gave you the, the thought to become an artist as you was growing up, uh, where you're from? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we're in a moment um, that was created by people like David Driscoll, which makes it so that if we are talking about contemporary art, modern art, um, American art, uh, global contemporary art, black artists are at the center of that, literally. If you walk through the museums in this country now, around the world, what we see now is an understanding of the mastery and the beauty and the rigor of the work of Black artists. And that has been seen by critics and curators and collectors and institutions. So that's, you know, again, the legacy of the hard work that was done creating the kinds of exhibitions that wrote in art history that allowed 
for this to be the case today. Yeah, that's really great because I saw that uh, in the documentary, David really went through a lot uh, mm -hmm. because he wanted to show African-American mm -hmm. works. And, and what I mean a lot is a lot of negative uh, comments and statements and things like that about mm -hmm. him just portraying the great artwork right. of the wonderful artists. Right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, oh, sorry. I, there was a second part. Do you want, or? Yeah, yeah. Is what that, inspired okay. you to be an artist? Even yeah. though you know, there's a lot of neg negative <laughs> out there before, what kept you going? Not in my house. That's the thing. I think that there was no, I was shielded from the negative because my family was posturing the positive. There were many positive representations of black people and black artists within the home. The irony is that a, a print of Faith Ringgold's and her book Tar Beach was one of the building blocks of my own kind of adolescence. And to be in this documentary where Faith Ringgold is centered in this conversation, as we've said, she, the work she was doing was pioneering in fact, and she created space for me to literally exist at this time. Um, and as a young person, I just saw the images of young black kids, Tar Beach, laying on their rooftop, imagining the world beyond the bridge, you know, that they were right. exploring the world. So I always had this sense that um, it wasn't an immediate sense, like, I'm going to be an artist, because I didn't know really any working professional artists. I, I just knew that artists had existed, that there was something called art history. Um, but I had no real sense of what that path could look or feel like. But I was definitely inspired by the work of creatives constantly. And those representations, I think, absolutely imbued themselves into my psyche as I developed my own sense of self and belonging in the world. That I just knew that however I decided to be, I belonged. Um, and that I could make a space for myself or imagine a space for myself no matter what. Well, quick comment. When you tell people you're an artist, do you have to explain what type of artist you are? I think it depends. I tend to say that I'm a painter because I am like a painter's painter, painter, painter. Like I love paint. Like that's not his the <laughs> material that I live and breathe. Um, and there are other people who would use a more broad term such as artist because maybe there are different facets of their kind of sense of being or identity. It's again, it's another kind of labeling that um, is important to the individual, but I think to the greater sense, the narrative is, yeah, I, I, there's no question I'm an artist. The way that I probably think and engage with the world is through the lens of an observer who likes to manifest physical representations of those observations um, and making. So yeah, I definitely am an artist, painter, teacher, professor, woman, yeah. black, all those things. <laughs> yeah, all those Thank things are much. true, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kim Singleton again. Um, I think this documentary is important because it highlights another aspect of African American history that's not in the forefront. And the documentary mentions how so few Black artists, like I think they said 1.2%, are featured in major museums. And I would imagine that the percentage of curators, of African American curators, is even smaller. Uh, could you guys comment on what we can do or what is being done to push Black art more in the forefront so it gets more recognition and more people will buy the pieces? Yeah, well, um, I, I think the answer to that is really why we're here today. I think, you know, more recognition um, comes from more understanding and more knowledge. And that's really at heart what I think this documentary does. It creates more awareness that then allows for uh, more people to know of the breadth and the depth of the work made by black artists to be able to see, um, go to museums, to galleries and, you know, and not just buy work. I mean, even we are happy for people just to experience, you know, works of art in museum environments. So I think that's the answer. It's doing work like has been done um, by HBO um, on behalf of creating this documentary. Um, Kathy Woods Cup of Soul Show. Um, my question is, uh, I love the documentary. What can people do in order to support the art? Because I think a lot of people feel as though you have to spend thousands of dollars, you know what I mean? In order to be able to support black artists. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Well, I think to support Black artists, one can support uh, Black institutions. You can become a member of museums. 
You can support Black artists by buying the catalogs of the exhibitions um, that their work has been in. You can visit the exhibitions themselves. And then of course, one can collect work at a whole range of possibilities, not only works that cost, you know, lots and lots of money, but, you know, at every level. So I think that, you know, the idea of supporting, there's a whole range of possibilities. And what the hope is that everyone, you know, I say often young people ask me this, you can start by just following those artists yeah, whose work interests you on social media right engage with their work as they are showing work work you know jordan is often putting up works in progress showing us where her works are just even that level of engagement um, is an important level of support that then can go all the way to the level of collecting work and living with it thank you so much thank you for taking the time to take my question as well thank you no worries jordan no worries. thelma thank you so much yes. for your the work that you do and also thank you for joining us today on behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, make sure you check out Black Art on HBO. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.